This is the fifth in our series of lectures on section 1.6, and in this lecture we're going to make some general comments about the working definition of the limit of a function. So um, here you'll see that I've written down the very formal definition of this statement that the limit of some function as x goes to some real number a is equal to the real number l. Okay, so here's the formal definition. In words it says, for every positive real number epsilon, there exists a positive real number delta, such that for every real number x, if absolute value of x minus a lies between 0 and delta, then the absolute value of f of x minus l is smaller than epsilon. So the idea of the definition is that you uh, imagine that you've got this adversary who gives you this number epsilon and asks you the question, can you force f of x to be within epsilon units of the number L? And you respond by saying, yes, I can choose this number delta so that no matter what value of x I'm then given, as long as x is within delta units of the number a, then indeed the corresponding f of x value will be within epsilon units of the number l. So this very, very formal and precise working definition of limit achieves the intuitive goal um, that you've used up until this point, um, which says that if x uh, is sufficiently close to the number a, then f of x can be made arbitrarily close to the number l. But this is the working definition of limit, and so any time any, any mathematician tries to say anything about limit, um, one has to use either this working definition or something that can be deduced from it, some theorem that one can deduce from it. Now at this point we don't know any theorems, and so all we can really do is make use of this working definition. So here's a simple exercise for you to practice. Write down in symbols what it means to say that the limit as x goes to 3 of 2x squared plus 5x plus 1 is equal to 34. So essentially all you're doing is you're just copying this down again, but you're being very specific about I guess we've now assigned what a is, and we've now assigned what f of x is, and we've now assigned what l is. So write this down, but um, be very specific. Okay, put your video on pause and give it a try. Okay, so uh, here's my solution. I've just copied this out again. For every epsilon bigger than zero, there exists a delta bigger than zero such that for every real number x, if the absolute value of x minus 3 is between 0 and delta, then the absolute value of 2x squared plus 5x plus 1 minus 34 is less than epsilon. So I've just asked you to be very specific, and also make sure you don't forget to, uh, to write in these absolute value bars. Those are quite important. Okay, here I'm just uh, reminding you again of the definition, and I'm going to ask you to do another exercise with it. Okay, this time I want you to um, write down in symbols what it means to say that the limit of a certain function as x goes to a certain a is not equal to a certain number l. So essentially I'm asking you to be very specific about this, but this time it's not equal, so you're going to make a useful denial of this statement here. Okay, so it's a good exercise because there are lots of variables, and we've got this rather complicated looking conditional. So go ahead, put your video on pause, and uh, write down a useful denial of this with uh, using these specific parameters uh, a, l, and f of x. To give it a try, when you come back, you can look at my solution. Okay, so here's my solution. 
uh, in order to show that uh, this limit is not equal to 20, you have to show that uh, the negation of this statement is true, and so that's what we're going to write down. We're going to write down a useful denial of this. So, always read from left to right. So when we look here, we start by saying, there exists a positive number epsilon. Okay, so reading the top one from left to right, we get there exists a positive number epsilon, such that for every positive number delta, positive real number delta, there exists a real number x, such that, and now this is p implies q, so down here we have to write p and not q. So it's absolute x minus 2 lies between 0 and delta, and absolute 3x plus 5 minus 20 bigger than or equal to epsilon. Okay, so that's the useful denial of this statement, and that's what it means precisely to say that the limit of 3x plus 5 as x goes to 2 is not equal to 20. So this statement that we've written here is, pre is precisely stating the intuitive idea that there exists some special number epsilon so that no matter how small a delta we pick, you can always find some number x that's within a distance of delta of the number 2 with the property that your f of x is farther away than epsilon from the number 20. Okay, so you're never really able to force f of x to be within epsilon units of L whenever x gets um, sufficiently close to the number A. But once again, whether or not you have a good sense of that intuitive idea, this is the formal definition here. So two of the really important tools that we make use of when working with limits are the triangle inequality and the reverse triangle inequality. So triangle inequality says the absolute value of x plus y is less than or equal to absolute x plus absolute y and also absolute x minus y is less than or equal to absolute x plus absolute y. And the reverse triangle inequality gives you a, a reverse estimate. It says the absolute value of x plus y, or absolute x minus y, is bigger than or equal to absolute x minus absolute y. So the idea is you're starting with an expression like this, and in the triangle inequality you're trying to replace it. You're estimating it by a quantity which is bigger than or equal to that. Um, and so in this case, you're trying to get what we call an upper bound on absolute x plus or minus y. This is your upper bound, what we might call an upper estimate. And in the reverse triangle inequality, you're getting what you would call a lower bound. You're trying to produce something that's a little bit smaller than it in order to estimate it. The one thing I want you to notice when you're applying this reverse triangle inequality, say the one with the minus sign, I want you to notice that if you're taking absolute x minus y or absolute y minus x, it doesn't matter which order you write them because the absolute value is the same. You see, x minus y and y minus x are equal up to a factor of minus 1. So when you take absolute value, that's completely discarded. So these two things are exactly the same. Um, so essentially you're making a choice when you apply reverse triangle inequality. Um, you can either write absolute x minus absolute y, or you could equally well write absolute y minus absolute x. But one of those two will typically be negative, and the other one typically positive. Putting a negative lower bound here is really fairly useless, because this thing is always at least zero. So you would always want to write it in the order where you're putting um, the bigger one of the two um, first. Okay, so you're sort of making a choice when you apply uh, the reverse triangle inequality. Now I claim that the reverse triangle inequality can actually be deduced as a consequence of the ordinary triangle inequality. So as an exercise I'd like you to try to prove that this occurs 
and I want you to make use of the ordinary triangle inequality in order to do it. Now the idea is that if you look at the right hand side you'll see that there's really a less, you, you want to view it in this way um, as what it's saying is that absolute x let me just do the one with the negative sign the, the one with the positive sign is similarly done okay so this is what you're you're trying to show because this this thing is equivalent to this one here i've just brought the absolute y over to the other side okay so question is why should this thing be true and there's a really old and useful trick in mathematics, which is you start with something that you're interested in studying, and you add and subtract the same thing, so that you're not really changing anything. And now you see if you group these terms together, and you just apply triangle inequality, where this is your what used to be called x, and this is what used to be called, well, this is still called y, so just apply triangle inequality and you get that that's less than or equal to this plus this and see if that doesn't give you what it is you want. So that's the idea of the proof. So put your video on hold and see if you can do this exercise and uh, when you come, come back you can compare your answer to mine. Okay, so here's my solution. Um, it's a universally quantified statement that we're trying to prove here. So you're going to begin by saying, let x and y be real numbers. So that's what I did here. And now it's not a conditional statement, so there isn't anything left for you to do, but just prove that it's true. And so I put, then we have, and then I start with absolute x, and I add and subtract my y, I apply triangle inequality, but I put, I, I explained it here, so I put a comma and I said, where we've applied the triangle inequality and the last inequality. And then transposing the y term on the left, or to the left, gives this, which is exactly what it was that you wanted to prove. So now in the next video, we're going to do some exercises that make use of both the triangle inequality and the reverse triangle inequality.